Hello, Revere, and welcome to our Memorial Day show. Today we are honoring our veterans. We're going to be showing the veterans that appear on the early show, and those that we do not see on our early show will be seen at a later date. So thank you again. Oh, it's, um, uh, was probably six of the greatest years of my life. Uh, as anybody that ever served in the armed forces will probably attest to, um, even those that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, we're in at very, very difficult times. You know, as you reflect back, you know, the, the job that you do and the purpose that you serve, uh, you know, there's no nobler calling. And uh, so as I reflect back, it was really six of the greatest years of my life. Um, got to meet some, some, you know, some great people, uh, saw the world. And, uh, you know, in, you know uh, as part of a uh, uh, carrier group, I, I was uh, four and a half years on the uh, aircraft carrier USS Independence. And uh, as part of a battle group that really toured the entire world uh, through many peacekeeping missions. Uh, we were in Grenada during the Grenada invasion. Uh, over in Lebanon, we responded to the... Uh, uh, marine barracks suicide bombing over there so you know unfortunately there's been times throughout our history and consistently you know today yesterday a hundred years ago that always require a strong military and, and uh, it was really um, uh, very very fulfilling for me uh, um, you know to, to uh, serve those six years so and I served uh, in the second marine division in Camp Lejeune for from there I several deployments uh, one of which was in Beirut um, Lebanon Beirut, Lebanon, after the uh, the bombing yeah. that took place, we were on. That uh, was in the 80s, wasn't that it? That was in 1983, correct. Yep. And uh, speaking of monuments that uh, that are prevalent in history, we have our monument. We have one in Boston for the Massachusetts Beirut veterans that were killed. There was nine Marines that were killed in uh, from from Massachusetts that were killed in the Beirut bombing, and there's a memorial for them in the Columbus Park area of, uh, in the North End. Wow. Now I got to take you, make you where you really became a hero officer for the city of Camp Boston and Revere. On the Boston Marathon, mm -hmm. how did you people first know that Joka was in that boat? Uh, apparently, the homeowner and the boat owner, as it were, um, noticed that the ladder was up on the side of the boat and he didn't leave it there. He went out to investigate and saw that the the opening, the boat was opened up and he hadn't left it open. And apparently, he, I, I think he saw some blood or whatnot. And when he, he looked inside and saw him. Oh, he saw him. And that's, from what I've been told, that's when he went and uh, he called 911. Um, some police officers responded. There was some sort of an exchange of gunfire that had taken place. Um, at that point, a call went out for tactical teams to respond. And uh, we happened to be, at that point, working in conjunction with the Boston Police SWAT team. So we followed them in trace to the the house on Franklin Street, and that's where uh, we captured them. Oh, we were part of the, the arrest right. team. That's a wiser man than me once said, you know, I'm not a hero, but I served in the company of, of heroes. And that's what I do. Right. But someone distinguishes himself above and beyond that word of hero. That's why we have the Congressional Medal of Honor. Many officers uh, let have. Let me tell you. I've, I've had many brave, Officer Mullen, for, for instance. Uh, you know, right. when, when we went to Watertown, I'm wearing full body armor, I'm carrying a rifle, and I have uh, the, the force of my entire SWAT team behind me. Officer Mullen jumped the fence, saved a little, uh, that boy that was being attacked by two Rottweilers alone. That's a hero. That, yep. So, you know, you, it's, it's, um, there's plenty of heroes here. There's plenty of heroes, and not just in police officers, the teachers are heroes, firemen are heroes. Oh, definitely, um, definitely. Mom and dad that get up and go to work and support their family are heroes. That's right. You know, the, you don't need to have a, a multi-million dollar sports contract to be a hero. But yours was a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, Jared C. Monty. Could right. you tell us how that all happened? Jared and his co-leader, Sergeant Christopher Cunningham, then made a head count of the soldiers on the hill and found that one was missing. They couldn't account for a young private, 22-year-old private by the name of Brian Bradbury. Brian was stuck in the middle of that plateau in a very small depression. Sergeant Cunningham turned to Jared and said, I'm going out to get Brian. And Jared looked back at Chris and said, no, you're not. He's my boy. I will get him. He then tightened his chin strap and ran out to try to get Brian. 
the enemy fire was so intense that Jared was driven back behind a small rock. Being the kind of person that he was, that is, someone that would never, ever give up, someone that always tried his hardest at everything he did, someone that always had to do the right thing, and the right thing was to go get Brian. So Jared rose up a second time and went out to try to get Brian. He headed out to get Brian a third time. Now it seemed that every single enemy was trained on him because everyone knew where he was. And as he went out to get Brian, he was hit with a rocket-propelled grenade and went down. As he lay there bleeding, his fellow soldiers called to him, Monty, Monty, come on, you can make it, you can get back here. But he was so badly injured, he was not able to crawl back to a position of safety. As he expired, he told his soldiers, excuse me. That's okay. You want to fish him? No, I'm fine. He told his soldiers two things. First, he said, I made my peace with God. And secondly, he told them, tell my family that I love them. And we love them too. Thank you. Would you like to show the people of the city of Revere a picture of your son, Paul? Sir. Sure. Would you like to read the bottom of this to, to them if you wish? No. It's just this is the citation for the Medal of Honor. It's Jared with the Medal of Honor. Can you zero in on this picture of his son from the TV studio if possible? Is it possible? Oh, it's terrific. How old was he, if I may ask you? Jared was 30 at the time. Yep. My son was 31, I run See that? Not married, because Jared had always told me, he said, Dad, I'm not going to get married while I'm in the service. He said, there's no way. He said, I don't want to leave a widow and, and orphans behind. So. It says, the United States of America, to all who shall see these presents, greeting. This is to certify that the President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3rd, 1863, has awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor to Staff Sergeant Jared C. Monty for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, in action with the enemy. In Nuristan Province, Afghanistan, on June 21, 2006, given under my hand in the city of Washington, this 17th day of September, 2009, and it's signed by President Barack Obama. Tell us what you would like to see the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts do for veterans and for you? For the veterans, Monday is Veterans Day. You can do one of three things, or all three if you wish. First of all, if you see a veteran, please go up to them, shake their hand, and thank them for their service. Because without them, we would not be a free country. We would not have the freedoms that we have. Second thing, if you can't do the first, go to a local cemetery. Visit a grave with a flag on it, because all the, flags of our, all the graves of our veterans will have a flag on it on Veterans Day. Just stand in front of it and thank that veteran. And thirdly, if that's not possible, find a quiet moment in your home and just bow your head and thank the veterans for their service and what they've done for this country. Thank you. People have missions in life. People are telling me, like, you don't need to go back. You won so many things and so many awards. Why you want to go back? It's for the people. So you're still in the Army, actually. I'm still in the Army. I still love this country, and this is my job. This is what I do best. Right. We have a bunch of flags here. This one I didn't see. This one I just saw. Oh, noticed. that's the CIB. Right. That we just read. Show that to the folks. This is a CIB medal that you win. You must be in combat 
and engage the enemy in a firefight in order to win this. And also, I was given this by General Petraeus himself. That's an honor and it's all That's, right. That, he's a great individual. Right. You have a couple of more citations up there. Can I see, like, for example, by the way, folks, in case you want to know. This is the Purple Heart. Is that, yep, that's the one we just showed. This is my archon for Valor right, right here. This is our archon for the end of tour. Right. And we have a load down here, but I don't know we'll have all that time. But here's one that you could explain to the people. This one is... That's the archon with the V device on it. The V is for Valor that I got from General Petraeus himself, who came from Iraq, flew to Afghanistan, awarded me... I believe you said there was only three? There was three individuals that got awarded. One got a bronze star, the other one got a purple heart. I got the medal for valor and a purple heart. Fantastic. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, 1954 when I graduated from uh, Boston University with my master's degree and being at that age, I had to go into the, the service. I had two choices. I could have joined the Army and stayed for four years as a second lieutenant, but I didn't want to do that. I decided to be drafted into the U.S. Army for two years. And as a result, after being, uh, I, I would say, uh, taken care of in New Jersey and then being sent to Korea for six, over 16 months, uh, I met some wonderful people, the, the young soldiers that were serving their time in Korea. And as a school teacher, I taught them many, many things. And not only did I teach them, they taught me because they had so much to offer. Uh, as, as uh, well, I, I guess you call them as uh, non-officers. Uh, they, they put a lot of time into the United States Armed Forces. and. Uh, they gave so much to the United States that it's hard to say what, how you can benefit somebody like this who gives almost, well, not, not their life, thank God, but of course a lot did. Uh, it was just wonderful being in, in Korea. While I was in Korea, I lived in a tent and had a M4 rifle with me at all times. And uh, it wasn't the easiest thing to do, but you get used to it. And I enjoyed, like I say, over 16 months in Korea, and I met some wonderful people. Yeah, I have a, <clears throat> a served in Vietnam from 67 through 69. Um, I was in the infantry. Uh, during, uh, just as the Tet Offensive was ending and uh, got wounded over there, come home with a purple heart and a few bronze stars, and, yeah, and I'm, I'm here, and that's a good thing. I'm, so glad, I'm, I'm glad to see you and, here. Uh, got myself involved in a lot of the uh, local organizations in the city. Right, but I want to talk about something else, Wesley. Mm -hmm. I know we're up there in age. I'm yeah. 84. <laughs> I guess you're 65. Yeah, I yeah. am. In your 60s, because you yeah. see Vietnam vets are in their exactly. 60s. Yeah. What are your plans after when you plan to quit, retire? What would you like to do? Well, I guess what I'm doing... Besides go fishing and swim. Well, I guess I'm doing what I like to do right now. What You'd I'm like doing now is just um, getting the organization up and running and raising money for these endeavors I mentioned, Moose Hat, Moose Haven. It kind of keeps me busy, and I like doing that. I'm helping out, and uh, I just can't sit home and... Uh, Play solitaire. I know, and by the way, I got to tell you something. When I called the moose, sometimes they ask in the morning, are you yeah. there? Don't you go home at night? I mean, you're there at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock? I, I put a lot of hours in down there because we were, were undergoing some um, renovations. The trip that I remember when I was the National Commander was when I went to Belgium. And I went up to the Ardennes where the Battle of the Bulge 
happened. Oh, really? And they took me up there, and there was a museum up there with all these American uh, uh, equipment from the Army, and there was German stuff up there. But on this one Army truck, they had all the soldiers that visited sign the truck and put their name and oh. where they lived. And I was looking at it, and I see this name from a gentleman from Westboro, Massachusetts. And I was so excited. Someone from Massachusetts, Massachusetts signed it. Right. And I, I wrote down his name, and when I got home, I called him. And I t you know, this uh, museum was called the 39-45 Museum. And it's, uh, it's online uh, if people want to look at it. And it's all about you know, the Battle of the Bulge and the, the war at the time. And uh, the people that did it were called M&M, &M, Marcel and Marceau, believe it or not. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> and they met later in life and combined all their stuff from the farms they lived on. And I called this gentleman and I said, sir, you don't know me, uh, but I have uh, regards for you. And he said, yeah, I could tell on the other side his face was all cringed. Trying to say, I don't even know this guy. How would he know anybody mm. that I know? And I said, M&M. &M. And you could almost see his face perk up the way, nice. oh, when did you see them? Oh, oh, how are they? And, you know, and it was so exciting. And then they finally came to the United States oh. uh, last summer out in Westboro. They went to visit him. I couldn't make it. But uh, it was just an exciting time to see uh, everything going on uh, during one of my so good experiences. Go. I can tell you a good one. Please do. I was on watch one night, and I had my rifle was laying on the side. And all of a sudden, I peek out, and I see somebody walking with a light. So now, I couldn't have my rifle on the side, so I went out, and all I had was my bayonet. And I took the bayonet, and I said, I was scared. I said, who goes there? And the guy says, it's me, officer. Put that, put that thing away. Oh, it's one of your... Uh, right. Patriots. So the officer goes back to the base. He says, never go out that place at night. He says, that guy's going to bain at you. <laughs> they didn't call me. I'd like to start oh, with oh, you. Youngest first. <laughs> okay, Miss Lounsbury, if I may call you that. Should I call me Karen? Right. You. you do a lot for the veterans, but more important, you are a gold star mother. And if you would like to, I would like you to tell us about your son, if it's possible. Sure. Um, my son... PFC Brian Lounsbury was um, in the Army, and he was killed while he was on active duty. And wh where? In, uh, in Fort Hood, Texas. He and was, how old was he, Miss Lounsbury? He was 18. He was hit by a, a car driven by another soldier. That's sad. That is really sad. Thank you. That's friendly. And you, Mrs. Johnson? Uh, I mean, you... Oh, I lost my boy in uh, August 27, 1967. He was in uh, Hoi An in uh, Vietnam. He was uh, in the 3rd MP Battalion, and uh, he was hit by uh, a machine gun at a hospital. And I had an opportunity to go to Vietnam with uh, three boys who were all stationed over there, and they had names I can't, right offhand I can't think of it right now. And they paid for our way, we were there for 15 days and we went from the top of Vietnam to the bottom and we went all over and my son sergeant from Connecticut came up and went with me. And I also got to meet a friend of my son's out in California while we were waiting for the plane to go to, to Vietnam. Uh, it has brought kind of a closure where I know what kind of a country that he last saw, the, my side, his life was gone, and, and the next thing I know, he's home, but I wish he had come home walking instead of being carried home. Thank you. Thank you, Flo Johnson, and you too, Karen Lonsbury. Mrs. Sullivan, could you tell us a little about your son, because I'm getting emotional. Okay. Um, our son, Captain Christopher Sullivan, um, was um, always bound for the military. He was in Civil Air Patrol as a... a early on in, in grammar school, and uh, actually his senior year of high school, he was a cadet commander for the Worcester um, Civil Air Patrol. Um, he went into uh, college right out of high school. He had joined the National Guard, 
and the next year he ended up going into um, the Army Reserve because he started doing ROTC at the University of Mass Lowell. He was commissioned and assigned to Germany, um, over in Vilsack, Germany. He was like a tank commander at first. They um, went into Kosovo for six months, and while he was there, he got bored with um, the tanks because they couldn't really move them around over there. The roads weren't <laughs> uh, capable of carrying them. And he uh, went into uh, advanced scout. From there, he came back to the States and went to school to, to study to be a captain. And then he um, was sent to Fort Hood, where he got ready to deploy to uh, Iraq. And he was killed in Baghdad, Iraq, on January 18, 2005, three weeks before he was coming home. That's it. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, right. first of all, you are a Vietnam veteran. Yes, I am. I'm a World War II veteran, and I want to salute you, sir, and I want to thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I was a World War II vet, you know. No, no you weren't. You were a Vietnam vet. I, oh, yeah, <laughs> Vietnam vet. <laughs> Can't remember everything, you know. <laughs> but uh, when I uh, come, you know, it was in interesting in the Army, you know. I, like anybody, uh, it's hard to talk about it, so uh, you just don't say anything about it. But uh, when I come home, you know, just like most people, went back to work, and uh, the people around me uh, gave me the support I needed to uh, adjust after being in the service for a few years. So uh, I, w I was, like, probably uh, pretty lucky, you know. I. Uh, don't have any effects from Agent Orange that I know of, so I feel I'm more than lucky. I'm pretty lucky to have you up here, sir, and I want to thank you for your service. You know, I got a little emotional. Yeah. Thank you. Why did I enter? Because the war was in full blast. My, my uh, three or four of my uh, cousins have gone in. One got killed. Um, my brother was in there. And the whole atmosphere was all war. We were deprived of many things because of the war. We had to. You had to go to save the country, sure. Well, I was stationed at uh, Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C., and that was the uh, amputation center for the Army. So that's the kind of work I did. I helped the men that had uh, arm and leg amputations, yeah. Thank you. Was and we're all right. I grew up in Canarsie, Brooklyn, and I knew I would never see the world. So I used to run away from home. I ran up to Redland, yeah. Vermont, got on a train with my buddy. We had a friend. His name was Johnny Matarazzo. And we would ride the freight trains like hobos. And that's how we got to see the countryside. We went up to the Caskills in New York. When I turned 16, I said, I'm going into the Army. I almost made it, but with luck, they threw me out because of my age. So as soon as I turned 17, which is the same age as you two kids are, mm -hmm. I went back and enlisted. I took my training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Then they shipped me overseas to, uh, on a ship to Bremen, Germany, which is near Bremerhaven. From there we got out. We went to Marburg, and we were stationed in Marburg for a while, which was the SS barracks. That's where I stood until they assigned me to another spot. And, uh, then they sent me to Salzburg, Austria, excuse me, then to Vienna, and before we go in, that's where it ended, and until they, they sent me to Berlin later. Yeah. I said to my boss, I'm going in the Army, whether you like it. Oh, no, you can't go. You have first preference in here. You can't. I said, I don't care what you think. I'm going down the draft board and have myself drafted, <laughs> and that's what I did. I had myself drafted, and I got in the, in the Army, and I took my basic training at Camp Wheeler, Georgia. A few, after I got through with my basic training, they put us on boats, and we went along with a flotilla of ships surrounded by, by, by uh, cruisers, battleships, and whatnot, so that we wouldn't be bombed by the Germans, because they were, they were using their submarines to shoot everybody down. They didn't care who it was. So we finally got across, and I landed in, Lava, in France. And, I landed in a little town called Rennes, France, R-E-N-N-E-S. And they told, it was about the, on the 4th of, of uh, 1945. <clears throat> they told us that we were going to join 
the 106th Infantry Division. That was a division that Ronstead beat the hell out of them during the bulge. The bulge was one of the biggest wars we had in World War II. I uh, went in the Air Force in 1962, and I served until February of 67. I was stationed in uh, Rome, New York for two years, and I was uh, shipped to uh, Evreux, France for uh, two and a half years. So uh, it was uh, quite an experience. Right, so let me thank you for your service. Now what we have... Service. Well, actually, to be very truthful, I was in the service twice. My first term, term in the military was at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. I was a brand new second lieutenant, and I actually became a company commander while I was in Fort Huachuca. Isn't that the place where Geronimo was located at one time? I'm telling you, that's where they captured Geronimo, and that also is the home of the Buffalo Soldiers. Now, how many people know that? It's amazing. I get a good history lesson here. Well, I'm just giving you some, some uh, service. Now, I actually, now in retrospect, I should have stayed in the Army because to me, the military is just a wonderful. I'm 100% behind our mil military. You came to our senior center one time and you played taps for us and you did a beautiful job. How did you learn to play the trumpet? Uh, I've been playing a trumpet since I was in grade school at St. Anne's School in Dorchester. And uh, I actually played a trumpet in St. Anne's Band and I played all the way through Northeastern University. I was in the Army ROTC Band at Northeastern. So, uh, when I went on active duty, in March of 1960, I took my trumpet and I put it down. And I left it down for 50 years. Hello out there again. My name is Morris Morris. I'm a World War II veteran, considered one of the greatest generation. But each name that I'll be reading is also part of the greatest generation because they were killed in action. May God rest their soul. On the Korean War, we have Shirley B. Andrews, Hugo F. Carosa, Frank Chirito, Gerald Chiapo, Joseph Concanon. Bernard A. Canali, Bernard Knisnik, Robert S. Morrow, William A. Chivalry, Walter Smart. On the Vietnam War, we have Robert L. Blaze, Sebastian E. DeLuca, Arthur Allegro, Jr., Alan J. O'Brien, Jr., Walter S. Olinsky, Jr., Stephen J. Penta. And on the Gulf War, we have Daniel F. Cunningham, Lawrence Salomon, Matthew J. Stanley, Nelson Rodriguez. Every one of these was killed in action because they are of the greatest generation also. May their souls rest in peace and thank you for tuning in.